So this morning we dealt with this uh, dukkha, with this, this sense of dissatisfaction and unease which runs through all our lives. Um, and then the causes of that, which are our basic misapprehension of how things really are and who we really are, which results in um, our clinging and grasping and fear of um, the flow of life, of, of the impermanence which is manifested within us and without us. And uh, then from that, the fact that that is not our original nature. Our true nature is something so much more incredibly incredible. And the reason why, therefore, the great Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the enlightened masters have so much compassion for us because we have so much potential and we don't understand, we don't know. We identify with all the wrong things and we, we don't see what is there right in front of us, so close to us, it's as close as our breath, but we, we, we overlook it because we are so identified with our surface conceptual thinking mind, which is governed by our egoistic attachments. So we suffer. And we don't just suffer, we cause great suffering to everyone else too, and to the planet. And, you know, it's very sad. We're destroying ourselves, we're destroying other beings, we're destroying nature, we're destroying everything. Why? because of our greed, our attachment, our anger, our jealousy and competition, and underlying it all, our incredible ignorance of our true being. So it's very sad, but the Buddha said, never mind. <laughs> um, these uh, afflictive emotions are not our true nature. They are what are called adventitious, meaning that they come, then they're habitual responses, but they're not our, our true nature. If they were our true nature, we could never get rid of them. We're stuck with it. We're sinful beings. We're not sinful beings. Um, a classical example is of, uh, um, but don't take these examples too tightly, right? But like a silver pot. A silver pot, if we don't clean it, gets tarnished. And so after a while, you look at it and all you see is black and you think, oh, this is a black dust pot. But if we rub and polish the pot, we can remove the black. And the actual silver pot has never been tarnished. I mean, the tarnish does not merge with the silver pot. It covers it, but it doesn't become the silver pot. So the silver pot is always silver. So if we rub the tarnish away, the pot's there. It never, ever incorporates the tarnish. And so this is like our, our nature, our true nature, however thick the black clouds, the sky is always there. It's like when you go up in a, in a plane, right, and you thick, thick clouds, and then suddenly, whoosh, and there's this vast blue sky. And down below this, those are the clouds. But look at this vast, open, spacious sky, which has never been obscured by the clouds. That's like our mind. Our mind is always there. The true nature of the mind is completely pure, completely awake. Anyway, so the goodness of the Buddha, the kindness and compassion of the Buddha was it not just that he realized this for himself, but that he showed a path. When I was 18 and I read my first book on Buddhism, it was a book uh, called the, the Mind Unshaken. And I was working in a library at the time and I was about to leave to go to Europe. And somebody brought in the book, I remember a Saturday evening just before I was leaving. And I had bought these books to read of Sartre and Camus and things like this. I was searching. Um, 
but then uh, there I, this, somebody brought in this uh, book called The Mind Unshaken, and I liked the title so much that I just picked it up and, and uh, put it out to myself and took it. And when I was in uh, wandering around Europe with my brother and sister-in-law, my mother, and I read the Sutton Commune, and then we got, th but I didn't read the book on Buddhism because I thought it would be too difficult and too boring. So um, I hadn't read it. And then when we were in Dusseldorf Airport, there was fog over London. So we were delayed for eight hours, and Dusseldorf Airport was a non-airport. I mean, there was nothing there. And I don't think you could even get a cup of tea. It was a, a military airport. My brother was in the RAF. And so there was nothing to do. So I thought, oh, God, well, I'd better read this book on Buddhism. <laughs> That's the only thing I had left. And so I started reading it, and it was, a, it was the book to read, if you don't know anything about Buddhism, in that it was written by this journalist, this English journalist called John Waters. And it was about his time in Thailand. And then uh, about uh, basic uh, Theravadin Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Three Signs of Being, karma, rebirth, and so forth. I mean, the bare bones, which is perfect. And I, I remember reading it, and then halfway through, I said to my mother, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and she said, oh, are you, dear? Well, finish reading the book, <laughs> then you can tell me all about it. But the, the point was my gratitude to the Buddha for showing a path. He didn't just say, this is how things are and this is how things should be, but he showed a path which we actually could walk. And my gratitude to the Buddha throughout the years has been that he has shown a path, which is so clear. So this is what we're going to deal with this, this afternoon, uh, one of the paths, the, the first path which he set out, which is called the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path uh, deals with all aspects of our life. It's uh, right view, Right um, is the translation of samyak, as in samyak sambuddha, a perfectly enlightened Buddha. Samyak means something which is, is perfect and good and right, and, and as it should be. So it's usually translated as right, but it doesn't mean right against wrong. It's, it's like it's something perfect, how, you know, the, the fullness, the perfection of these various qualities. So the first is view, right view, then right thought or intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right uh, concentration or meditation, samyak samadhi. So we'll go through those. Um, we don't have endless amounts of time because I'd like to do half an hour of questions at the end in case anybody is completely confused. Um, but we'll try to do what we can here. So the Buddha starts. And up until even like Dzogchen practice, they also start with something called right view or samyak drishti. Right view, right understanding, right outlook, that starts it. Because what we consider to be of importance, how we look at life, what our basic view on what is important, what is not important, will influence everything we do. 
If our view is that we're here to have a good time and to get as much pleasure as possible, make as much money as possible, and so forth and so forth, that will influence everything we do and think and how our life's direction will go. If we think our most important thing is to serve our country, to serve our nation, to serve our race, to serve our family, to serve whoever, that is the way we will go. Those are the kind of decisions, life decisions, which we will make with our life, because that is our view, is our importance is to serve. If our, our idea is our most important thing is to wake up, to become enlightened, to you know, really fulfill our human potential, then those will be the choices we make in our life. So our basic view, our basic outlook on what is important, what is not important, and what we really want to give our energy to influences everything which we do, much more than we are usually aware of. And this is why the Buddha put it first. Here, the view um, traditionally is uh, the right view is to understand that our unenlightened, ordinary existence, our conventional existence is dukkha. That every, why is it dukkha? Why is it unsatisfactory? Because we tend to cling and hold on and feel afraid of losing people, things, status, health, anything we hold. But everything is impermanent. Everything is flowing. It's like a river, you know, it's, you, can't, you can't dam it up. It's flowing, changing, moment to moment to moment to moment. Our bodies are changing, our mind is changing, external phenomena is changing, situations are changing. All the time, moment to moment to moment to moment to moment, things are flowing, they're not static. And if we try to hold on to something which is flowing, we are going to suffer. And because everything is impermanent, because moment to moment everything is changing, including ourselves, there is nothing solid, endurable, and unchanging, which is the third principle of um, non-self. Non-self, which was also developed into the concept of emptiness, just means that we want to solidify things and make things self-existent from their own side. But we cannot do that because as soon as we start looking at anything, we can analyze it down and down and down and down. And we never can find the thing in itself. All we see are component parts which can be reduced and reduced and reduced on which we stick a label and say this is, this is something. But if we look for that something in the something, we can't find the thing in itself. And this again causes problems because we are always trying to solidify something which by its very nature is endlessly impermanent and changing both ourselves and others and external phenomena. So this is this view, this, this fundamental view that ordinary life led with our ignorant, egoistic consciousness, which we identify with falsely, causes problems. Problems for ourselves, problems for others, problems for the whole planet. And it's all based on the fact we don't see things clearly. We have wrong view. We think we are who we think we are. We believe our thoughts. We believe that things are stable and enduring. We don't, we deny impermanence and change. And we do think that things are substantially what we think they are, and we are substantially who we think we are. 
And that would be fine, except that it's n based on ignorance and therefore ultimately causes problems. Look at our world. Look at our world. Look at the suicide rate. The amount of people on opiates from affluent countries, not because they're dying of poverty. You have everything and you have nothing. So, the first is to under begin to try to understand things how they really are. Everything really lived from a conceptual delusory level creates problems. Because we grasp at something which is ungraspable, which is changing moment to moment, and we try to substantiate that, but it is not substantiatable, if that's a word. <laughs> and we are, all of this is derived from a wrong understanding of who we truly are. So the other way of saying right view is to say right understanding. Do we understand how things really are? To just begin to think about that, read about that, contemplate that, try to see things from a different view, a more open, spacious view. Things really are impermanent, what can we expect? Old age, sickness, death comes to all beings. What's so surprising when it happens to us? We are not who we think we are which is good news, because who we are really is literally beyond thought. So to get even a, an idea that this our nature of our consciousness is this open, spacious awareness, this bright clarity of cognizance, which is non-dual, it's not me, it's not other. There's this open, spacious interconnection with all beings. We are not separate. We are deeply interconnected because space, you cannot divide it. Outwardly, you can, you can take this and yes, the inner space, outer space, but like that, there's no division. And so even to get a glimpse of that transforms everything even a glimpse. In Buddhism, in all schools of Buddhism, there is this idea of the initial breakthrough. In Theravada Buddhism, it is called um, entering the stream. It's after that, definitely you're heading for Nirvana. It might take time, but you're gonna get there. And the next breakthrough, will be a once returned and never returned in nirvana. But that just that initial glimpse of nirvana changes everything. Even though you go back to the ordinary conceptual consciousness again, you've seen it. The clouds have parted. Hey, there's a the sky. It's not all clouds. There's a sky there. And so even if it clouds over immediately, you've glimpsed it. It's, everything's changed because now we know there is sky there and the clouds are not the ultimate. So in the Theravadin school, it's called entering the stream. In the Tibetan uh, school, it's called, well, in the, the Kaju Nyingma schools, it's called uh, seeing the nature of the mind, seeing into one's true nature, getting the view. Um, in, in certain Mahayana sutras, it's saying uh, a turning in the, uh, deeper levels of the consciousness. It's a shift in consciousness. In, in Zen, it's called Kensho or Satori. It's this breakthrough. You go back again, but now you've seen. Everything's changed. So that sh shift, even if it shifts back again, never mind, it's an enormous big step forward, even if it only lasts for a, a very short time. Everything changes. I, I knew someone who, um, an American uh, girl who was studying in, um, 
in Dhamshala. She was doing a course in Dhamshala, and then in the break, she was just wandering around the mountain, and she met a bear. And the bear attacked her, and her head was in the bear's mouth. And she thought, this is it. And she let go. And she had an incredible experience of the nature of the mind. And meantime, the person she was with, he threw stones at the bear. And so the bear left her, and she had these big gashes on her head. And um, so he had to take her to hospital. She had stitches. She said she was blissed. <laughs> she was in complete bliss, having had the, completely let go at all levels. And, and she just realized the nature of the mind. And then she became a nun. That's why we knew that these scars. She had these big scars over her head. I mean, she said her whole life just turned around. Another friend of mine, she was part of the Cartier family. And, uh, you know, so she, you know, had gone to all the best schools and gone to the best uh, finishing schools. And she was a little bit like this. <laughs> and, um, you know, she was married to the right sort of honorable so-and-so. And everything was wonderful, and she was on a train journey, and then she was looking outside, and then she had this, this concept of, you know, just watching everything going by, but not being part of everything going by. And anyway, she also just intuitively had a very deep experience in the nature of the mind. And she swore. I won't say what she said in such a polite society, but she, was, she swore heavily because it messed everything up. <laughs> but compared with that, you know, so she went to India to find a, a lama. She was a student at Upper Rinpoche and gave up her fiancé, gave up everything and, and just went off to, you know, find out, okay, what's this all about? So it's a very radical change. It's a real shift in our consciousness to a whole different level, even if it only it goes back again. Now you've seen something which you never saw before, which is it. So that view is very important to, to really change and, and recognize what that, you know, things are not the way they appear to be. And that at least at the very beginning to recognize the underlying dissatisfaction because of impermanence and grasping and the fact that ultimately we are not nothing that we normally would identify ourselves as being. So that's considered right view. So then we come to what you do with that. Once you've got that understanding, even, even conceptually, even to give it a, well, let's try to see the world from that point of view even if we haven't had a one-on-one -on -one direct experience, at least, well, probably it's true, yes, life is pretty dis unsatisfactory for most people because we do cling and want to make things the way the ego wants them to go and fear that things won't go the way the ego wants them to go and that everything, we cling to things hoping that that will give us security, but there is no security in clinging because everything is impermanent and change. The only insecurity is, the only security which we can have is in insecurity. You know, to recognize that everything is changing and that's okay. We can never be secure, so what? That security is never going to come on the conceptual level of trying to make things stay the way they are. So, once we have even begun to think like this and to consider how much everything is flowing, how there is no unchanging self in the middle of it all, in charge of everything, then we carry on. What do we do with that? So, the next one is, um, I think it's Sankalpa. <coughs> Samyak Sankalpa. Anyway, it means thought. It means thought or intention. In Buddhism, it is considered that everything which we do, thinking, speaking, acting, is prefaced by an intention. 
even if it's very quick and we're not even aware of it. I mean, in Burma, they have many meditation centers, especially Mahasi Sayadaw tradition, in which they slow everything down so much so that we can see the process, the mental process for doing anything. Intending, intending, lifting, lifting, reaching, reaching. Very, it goes very, very slow. And you watch people walking and they're kind of... Intending to see the, uh, the communication between our thoughts and intention and our actions, which normally is so quick we don't even recognize it. If we slow it all down, like a movie, if you slow it all down, then you see all the frames, one frame leading into the next, into the next, which usually is speeded up so we don't even see. It looks like action. So the right thought are thoughts which are connected with the opposite of wrong thought. Wrong thought would be those thoughts which are combined, coming with the inherent intention of greed, grasping, anger, irritation, annoyance, frustration, mm -hmm. ignorance, pride, jealousy, those negative qualities of the mind. So the opposite of that. So the opposite of greed would be generosity, contentment, appreciation, all those things which are not grasping, which are sharing, contentment with what we have, pleasure in giving to others, and so forth. All of these which are a counterbalance to our greedy, grasping mind, which likes to accumulate and hoard and doesn't want to share or give. And me, oh, wow, yes. Yeah. You know, the, the opposite of that is, oh, thou, that's beautiful, here. Just recently we were... Um, just recently, we were looking at some old photos um, Monica had from way back when, and uh, when we first started with the, the nunnery. And uh, so one of our old friends from that time was this wonderful uh, Hindu Swami called Swami Ramananda. And uh, he lived in this very simple little uh, mud brick ashram. And, uh, but he was a lovely Swami, and he had a number of very uh, devoted students uh, from the Punjab. And in those days, India was still cut off. It didn't, you couldn't buy things, and they didn't manufacture much modern appliances. So whenever Indians came back to India, they would have all these huge, great big boxes of refrigerators and televisions and all sorts of gadgets. Uh, for their family members, etc. Nowadays, they manufacture it themselves. But in those days, you couldn't get anything fancy. And so when they came, people were, wow, really excited about it. So his students from the Punjab, the Punjab are quite wealthy, would bring him all these kind of gadgets and appliances and all these fancy stuff from the West and offer to him. And he would look at it. And he would undo it all, and his eyes would glow, and he, wow, you know, and he would work out how it works, and he would be so excited and so happy and so grateful to get it. Thank you. Wow. Now, who would be a good person to give this to? And he would look around at all these other students, and he'd say, here you are. He didn't have sticky fingers. He, he didn't say, don't give this to me, I'm beyond this, I'm a swami, <laughs> you know, and then they felt bad. You know, he rejoiced, thank you. Wow, this is lovely, really kind of you to give me. But then, you know, he'd enjoyed it. Now, who would like this? He didn't need it. 
And so he was always, to my mind, comes up this, this quality of the joy in giving. The joy that we get from giving is more than the joy we get from getting. So this, this quality of thought, intention, which is um, connected with uh, the wholesome root of generosity and um, contentment and renunciation. Renunciation in the sense of just letting go, not clinging. And being able to just appreciate what you have without um, grasping it. If you've got it, you've got it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. <laughs>